Este como se entiende. Ah, So, um, hello everyone and welcome to this new event of the Cañada Blanc Foundation here at the LSE. For those of you that don't know me, I'm your host and my name is Andres Rodriguez Pose. I am uh, the Princesa de Asturias Chair here at the LSE and a Professor of Economic Geography and also the Director of the Cañada Blanc uh, Center at the LSE. Uh, today we have in this new series of the Cañada Blanche Lectures, we have the great pleasure of having the Ambassador of Spain to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Jose Pascual Marco, who is going to be talking about the bilateral relationships between Spain and the UK, but he's going to touch it from a broader angle, as far as I understand. This is uh, an important year. Um, there are going to be elections in the US in November. There will be elections in the European Union for the European Parliament. That would take place in June. There will be elections in this country, the UK. We don't know the date uh, for sure, but it's going to be sometime towards the end of the year, so probably around uh, December. And these elections, like elections in many other parts of the world, India are changing the world in the way we have seen it. We have much, far more bigger challenges, wars in the European doorstep. We're also having significant geopolitical challenges, significant processes of change from an economic perspective, deglobalization, change in the global production uh, chains around the world. And this is going to lead to a very, very different world. And Ambassador Marco is going to be talking about all these issues and bringing them to the more concrete realm of, let's say, the future of what's going to happen, especially in the UK and in its relationship to Spain. Let me just introduce uh, uh, the biography. I think uh, Jose Pascual Marco has got a very impressive biography. He is the ambassador of Spain to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, and since uh, August 2000, 2021, and as a diplomat by career, he has held an impressive array of uh, positions in all parts of the world. So I think he started in Pakistan, then Nicaragua, Australia, Turkey, South Africa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the USA, and Brussels as ambassador and deputy permanent representative of Spain to the EU. So he certainly can cover the whole world. In Madrid, among other roles, he has been Director General for Cultural Policy and Editorial Industries at the Spanish Ministry for Education, Culture and Sport. And from 2017 to 2021, he was Director General for Coordination uh, of EU Common Policies and General Affairs at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation. Ambassador Marco holds degrees in Law and Philosophy and a Diploma on in International Studies from the Spanish Diplomatic Academy. But as I said, you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to Ambassador Marco. So Ambassador Marco, the floor is yours. And after that, he'll take direct questions from all of you. So please be ready and be sharp with your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Uh, Professor Andres Rodriguez Pose. It's a privilege to be invited by him to this prestigious series of uh, lectures. And I would also like to uh, express my thanks to the Centro Cañada Blanche, responsible for this cycle of, of lectures. And the first thing I want to say, lo que quiero deciros, queridos amigos, queridas amigas, dear friends, 
uh, is thank you. Thank you for coming. There are so many things to do in London. I believe that my, my, my son told me the other day that Dune 2 is already out in the, in the cinemas. You could be doing so many things and you're here listening to me to an old father. So my first responsibility is uh, to ensure that you have a good time. And I'll try my, my hardest. And my second responsibility is that maybe you listen to something interesting that makes you think and also to learn from you. For me, it's very important to be here. I always learn and, and I always come back with something positive to use in my, in my job. So having said that, um, I've got here one of my collaborators, Eduardo Escribano. Uh, I have been told by some of my uh, harshest critics, my wife, namely, that um, I'm too uh, gloomy, that I'm the prophet of doom, too negative about what is happening in the world. I don't think so. I see myself as, a, as an optimist, but Eduardo is going to keep me honest. And he is to write down every time I use a negative or, or something especially you know, depressing, he will make a mark and he will tell us at the end of the, of the lecture how many of those banned expressions I have used. It will not be easy for me as uh, 2024 is shaping up to be a, a challenging, a stimulating year, but I will try my, my best. As Andres said, I've had a, I, I wouldn't call it distinguished, I would call it uh, checkered and uh, full of movement uh, career. I have traveled around the world. Uh, I've lived, not traveled, lived in five continents and in 10 uh, different countries. And um, I've always tried not to go back to Spain for my annual holidays, but to, you know, to walk, to, uh, to go around those countries, to meet the people there, to not to be one of them because that is impossible, but to understand them, to, to leave a bit of my heart in those countries. And what I can bring here today, maybe to you young people, is um, that experience of having the world under my eyes for 40 years, to see it change, to see the world tilt around its axis, to have a sense of change, of maybe even of, of direction. Uh, that is very important, I, I believe, for everybody, for you too. You have to be situated in space, but also in time. And in 40 years, I can assure you, the world has changed a lot. And my sense in the last 10 years, what I feel in the pit of my stomach is that change is accelerating, that we are moving faster and faster towards a fulcrum, towards a space of, of change. Um, and that has been very clear in the last three or four uh, years. We are going into what some people call clima incognita. We can see it in the transformation in the climate every, every year. We are going into the artificial intelligence black box. And even the experts cannot tell us what, what is inside that black box. We are going into the geopolitical unthinkable. We have forgotten about nuclear weapons, but I will tell you that in 2026, the last, the last treaty remaining, standing, restricting uh, nuclear weapons will expire. So we are moving into the unknown, not necessarily, Eduardo, a negative unknown, but, you know, a challenging unknown. You are all familiar with the, with the term of polycrisis um, tools. Now it is, it is in, in, in common use. It is uh, a theory that says that the shocks of the last 10, 15 years, they are interrelated or at least synchronized. There is risk, synchronization, and reinforcement of, of these risks. And what have we seen in the last 15 years? We've seen many good things, but we have also seen zoo pandemics like COVID. We have seen an acceleration of climate change, a huge financial crisis, the big, biggest one since uh, 1945, and geopolitical instability linked with a surge in populism and in author authoritarian regimes. And they are all tied to each other. And in some aspects, they reinforce each other. And 
is there a common thread? Uh, is this risk synchronization simply the effect, the objective fact that shocks amplify each other? Or there is a common thread? Well, um, the last thing I want to be is uh, Malthusian, is a determinist, a demographic determinist. But I must, I must tell you that when I started my, my work in Pakistan 40 years ago, the world had 4.5 billion people. It now has 8 billion people. And the last billion people were added in, in, in how many years? Do you think? Give me a figure. How many years to add 1,000 million people to this earth? 11. In 11 years. And the next uh, billion is going to be added in the next 14 years. And I can assure you, because I've seen it with my eyes in, in places transformed, places that had ceased to be, that 1 billion people is a lot of people. So there are nearly double the people that were on this planet when I uh, started in Islamabad 40 years ago. Uh, then uh, the science fiction novel you might know, Standing in San Siber, then that novel, the premise is that everyone in the world, those 4.5 billion people, if they stood with one meter around them, they could all stand in San Siber. Now they wouldn't be able to stand in San Siber. And we don't have double the people of 40 years ago. We've got 10 times the people 40 years ago because they consume a lot more, because they are a lot better communicated, much more interrelated. They, they lay a heavier weight on this planet, but at the same time, they bring all their qualities, all that interconnectedness to bear for good, for transformation, for a better planet. So, Eduardo, not the negative. <laughs> um, I think it is a Galileo law that quantitative change at some point in time makes for quantitative change. You can add one unit, two units, three units, and you have got the same substance. And then you add one more unit and you have a different substance altogether. And that is a bit what is happening now. That is maybe what I'm feeling in the pit of my stomach. That, that fulcrum I was talking about, that these increasing numbers and increasing interrelatedness is going to, to give birth to a, to a new world, to a different world. And here are we, Phono sapiens. Here are we, um, the new species, having to adapt to that change and also making the world adapt to it. There are two jokers maybe in the back of this transformation. One, I've mentioned both of them. One of them is artificial intelligence. We don't really know, but we should prepare and we should regulate. That's what the European Union is doing. And the other uh, joker in the park, in the in the park, is a joker that we have forgotten. Maybe because the, the latest generation, your generation, um, was a generation born after the Cold War. Um, you don't remember the fear, the pervading fear, the oppression that that uh, lay on the heads of my generation because of the threat of nuclear weapons. We have forgotten a bit about it. And also with the START treaties, with the SALT treaties, the number of nuclear weapons in the, in the world has come down drastically. But the threat hasn't disappeared. Anything possible is real. That was the, the theological argument of Ansel to prove the existence of God. Anything that exists, any possibility that exists will become real sooner or later. And the number of nuclear weapons is creeping up. Their quality is improving. There is both the United States and Russia have got in place um, tremendous programs for the replacement and improvement of their nuclear weapons. New types of weapons are, are being put in place right now. You heard about the scare a few days ago about a nuclear weapon in the in the skies. As I said, those salt star treaties have been lapsing and they haven't been renewed. The last one will lapse in 2026. And this joker in the park is a joker we really should avoid seeing laughing. We have, and we shouldn't laugh about it. This is something that we can do something about and we should do something about it. Um, so uh, I 
really think that 2024 is going to be an important year. We have got um, incredible conflicts uh, on, on the table. We have got Gaza, we have got the Ukraine, we have got, as Andres said, big elections uh, coming in the United States, in Russia, Russia too, in the European Union. But um, we can do things about these challenges. And I wanted to now lay, look at the positive side. What is the positive side? Well, the Ukraine, for example, the United, uh, the, uh, the European Union and the West in general stood firm and was firmer and more determined than in, than in 2014. And the Ukraine with incredible courage stood up to the Russians and we haven't lost. On the contrary, we are going to, we are going to win as long as we stand, stand fast. And it wasn't easy. Remember the, the response in 2014? Some of the problems we have seen now, it is because of the weakness and divisiveness of our response in 2014. We have had COVID, we have had a pandemic that was supposed to kill 1 billion people. And we once again came together, put in place uh, the right policies or the, the policies that policies that were rational in, the, in most cases, and also brought to bear our incredible technological prowess. We put on the table in, in a question of months, vaccines that normally would have taken tens of, of years, and we stopped the pandemic. We could have had after the pandemic an incredible economic crisis, like in 2009, 2015, but we show that human beings can learn lessons even Germans can learn lessons. I love Germans. But and instead of austerity, we put in place the most ambitious fiscal program ever from the European Union. And we were able to grow quickly out of the, uh, of the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. With our next generation funds, we are in the European Union preparing the future, the digital transition, and the transition to a more sustainable, and respectful of climate uh, model of, uh, of growth. So um, <coughs> climate change, once again, we should be optimistic. It is frightening what we see. Uh, you can, you can yeah, one mark there. It's a bit frightening what, what we can see. And sometimes we, sometimes I think, I mean, what, what has God got to do to make us conscious of what is happening? Because when you see 200 kilometer fronts of fire, Brooklyn clouded by, by smoke, 40 degree uh, summers in, in, in Spain, you ask yourself, what has poor God got to do to make us realize that we've got to take this extremely seriously? But once again, it's not that simple to act in, in a planet with the inequalities, with the divisions in this planet and with the very rudimentary architecture of uh, management of world affairs. But we have more or less managed with the um, COPs uh, conferences and with more or less collective action. And right now, production of renewable energies is going through the roof. I have gotten up and every day, uh, because I'm a bit obsessed by this, every day at around 10, 11, I look at uh, in this app as how uh, electricity demand is met in Spain. And for the last week, we have been lucky. There has been a bit of wind. I was looking at 70% renewables, 90% come through with nuclear and hydro, 90% electricity demand in Spain at 11 a.m. covered by renewables. 90%, that is low, the whole week. So we are making progress there. We've got to make faster progress, but we are making progress. So I've got here uh, a lot to say about what we have done during our presidency of the European Union, Spain. Uh, we have tried hard. Uh, it's only six months, but we have, we have been uh, lucky in approving important directives and, and regulations that are going to be important, as I say, for the future of the European Union. We approved the first regulation of artificial intelligence. And I think that is very important, not only because the heft, the weight of the European Union makes it one of, if not the greatest regulatory power in the world, but because of an example, the example, the example we set will make others look more seriously at regulating artificial intelligence. 
We have reached a migration pact, maybe not perfect, but for 15 years, we had been fighting about it. And it establishes an equilibrium between uh, restricting illegal migration, protecting the rights of migrants and sharing the burden among all the European Union states. We have kept the European Union on a fixed course on support for the Ukraine. We have also had at the last uh, Council of the European Union under our presidency, uh, make the, the, the Council of Heads of State, of Heads of Government of the Euro European Union, ask for a humanitarian pause on, on Gaza. And since then, uh, the European Union has moved forward in, in, in protecting, in trying to protect the rights of the Palestinians and of everybody involved in the conflict without, of course, forgetting the security of, of Israel. And Israel is, is a part of Europe. You cannot forget that. It's a part because of our history, because of many things, it's a part of Europe. We have had the first summit with Latin America, the forgotten continent. We forget about Latin America. It's 500 million people. They share a lot of our values and our goals, but we forget about them. And now China is the biggest uh, trade partner uh, of Latin America. They are very important allies. We should consider them part of our Western, not in the geographical, but ideological sense, Western coalition. We should pay more attention to them. And we are proud to have organized this summit. And uh, finally, but not less important, we, uh, we presided over European Council that decided on the enlargement of the European Union, including countries such as the Ukraine and Moldavia. The European Union is not afraid to step up to the plate. And the best way to step up to the plate is to say to these countries, you're going to be part of us. It's not that we support you, you're going to be part of us. We are looking at an interesting year in the European Union. There will be elections this year, as you know. 365 million people will, will be coming to vote. Um, we don't know what will happen. There will be a decrease of support for traditional parties. Uh, the, the big coalition that has steered the course for the European Union in the last four years, made uh, of uh, center-right, center-left, and in most cases also the Greens, we see its number of seats in, in the parliament go down. And the populist left and right, especially the populist right, is going to go up. But we still think that there will be a working majority in parliament. And that is very important. I mean, uh, elections in the European Union are becoming more and more important because, because of the weight that Brussels has in the life of everybody, in the life of any European. 60% of all legislation in Europe is made in in Brussels, and Brussels policies determine the rhythm of economic and social and political life in the European Union. So if finally Ursula von der Leyen continues to be the next president of the commission, and I think uh, she has done a very, a very good job, it will be important for her to have a sizable majority, because otherwise uh, policies such as the fight against climate change or a humane, uh, migration policy or support for the Ukraine could be threatened. What will the new commission uh, look like and look forward to? And with this, I'm starting to, to finish. Uh, well, the challenges are not over at all. Once again, it is the Ukraine. Once again, it is uh, trying to, to be proactive in the conflict in the Middle East and finding a solution and stopping the, the carnage. It will be increasing our strategic autonomy. That means uh, ensuring ourselves against geopolitical, technological uh, risk. We've got to be more self-sufficient. Uh, self As I said, the, the climate change policies, they are fragile. Many people, of course, um, it is impossible to fight against climate change and to make our economy sustainable without making some sacrifice. And of course, the groups, the sectors, the people who are more directly affected, well, they exert legitimately political resistance. But it's a fight that is worth fighting, and we've got to keep on doing these, these policies. And finally, defense and the Ukraine. As you know, 
the idea of a um, uh, commissioner for defense has been bandied. Europe has got to take seriously its defense. This is not about Trump. Every American president since Bush, Bush Jr. has been telling us, grow up, grow up. You are the most prosperous area in the world. I mean, the United States has more GNP than, than Europe. But I can tell you, I've lived in Washington for four years and I've gone all around the United States. Uh, there are a lot more richer people there than here. But the quality of life here is completely different. So you are living in a place where you can go to a hospital and they're going to treat you. The, you, you, you go in the street, the police is not going normally. <laughs> It's not going to shoot at you or, or to beat you up. You can express your opinion anywhere you want. You have unemployment benefits. You live, you are. We are privileged people. I've lived in Congo and I've, I've gone all around Africa. Your lives are the exception. The lives of, for example, the Congolese, there are 60 million of them, are not the exception. They are the rule for, for large numbers of people around the world. And this area, it's not going to protect itself. That hasn't ever happened. I think that that uh, Herodotus carried a, a, a shield at Platea. From the Greeks onwards until today, we have got to protect what we cherish, what we want to, to endure. So your generation would be called upon to fight. In the best uh, possible of worlds, it will be a, a non-bloody fight, but you will have to, to defend um, what I consider beacon of hope in the world, which is the, the European Union and the, and the UK. So to end this little lecture and to start listening to you and, and having a dialogue with you, um, challenging, interesting, stimulating. Uh, it, has been, it has been quite boring for the last uh, 60 years. That is the life I have lived. It's been boring. There's nothing has changed much. You know, that way the wall came crumbling down, but Apart from that, uh, but now change is coming and it can be good change. We can build a better world. Not we, not me. I mean, once again, I'm an old form. I don't know whether you remember uh, from, from the Bible, from the prophets, I think it is the Lord Joy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So I encourage you to have a to topic for IC to see visions, to systematically imagine a better world. Let us stop judging. We are, we are used to social media and to saying like this, like, and any event that, we, that comes to us, all the information we are bombarded with, we are, we are judging all the time. Judging is, it's not positive. You can do it at the end of the process. First, you've got to understand, understand how the system works, how the moving parts fit to each other, how, Things influence each other. What is important and what is not? What is the direction? Understand and then have a vision. And that vision should be a utopian vision. That is what I bring to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for oh, let's see if I... thank you very much, Ambassador, for a very enlightening and exciting speech. But now we have the challenge of the questions. And we have uh, quite a few hands. Remember, I always say in these conferences that uh, this is not a place to make statements. It's a place to ask a question. And the question starts by what, when, who, how, to what extent? So make that exercise when you start asking the question. And please, when you, I point to you, stand up and tell us who you are, where you're from, and that's it. So we start over here. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Um, the name is Ewan Grant. I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst who's worked in quite a number of different particularly colleagues. Uh, I'm now a broadcaster. Um, my question is um, Spain's recent presidency of the and the theme you mentioned of building a European life, and they're British, uh, relationship with, with 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the sole one. With Latin America, how did that go? And how that is that going forward? 2014, just after the lockdown, I was back. I was working for the EU delegation of the contractor. I put on the table a hard copy of Tom Clancy's farewell book, Command of Authority, and it said to the star, please put it in. Command of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your question. Uh, and it must have been interesting in, in 2014 in Kiev, that is for sure. Um, well, Latin America now is, is it's complicated the dialogue with Latin America because it is in political effervescence. Uh, it is a continent in evolution. Uh, also there we have the tension between populist uh, forces and also uh, between the, uh, the traditional right and, and the left. Um, the panorama is changing all the time. So it's not, it's not easy. It's not a country, it's not a continent united in itself. But we have got to keep up the dialogue. It must be a strategic dialogue. And we have got to sign Mercosur. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for agriculturalists. I'm sure that we can put money on the table so to make it there a while. But, but to have Mercosur is still, uh, you know, like uh, Banco's ghost uh, sleeping around the corners, dragging the chains around after more than 10 years of negotiating it. This is absurd. We are shooting ourselves in the in the foot. We need Latin America. We can learn from Latin America uh, and we can uh, profit from the relation with Latin America on all aspects and to start with on the trade aspect because we are talking here with Mercosur, we are talking 300 uh, million uh, consumers and producers. And also we've got to engage with them, engage uh, on the fight against climate change. We are talking here about Amazonia and this is we should be very concerned. We should help, we should engage on that. Thank you. Next question. Yes, over here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Josep. I'm from Spain and I study at Thank you very much. I'm Josep. I'm from Spain and I study at Sciences Po in France and UCL here. And my question is, uh, you mentioned the idea of a European defense. So aside from meeting the 2% target of GDP, etc., how do you see that conforming like structurally or <laughs> organization-wise? Considering that NATO already exists and also UN restrictions, considering also, what? Consider that we are in NATO and that we're also in the UN for security and military purposes. How do you see the idea of a common European defense conforming? If that's okay. what you meant, aside good. from the GDP. Good, good question. Um, here I'm going to to uh, answer it at length because I think it is it is quite important and and more complicated than than we think. Uh, NATO is essential. I mean, we, we cannot live without NATO. When there is a big problem, NATO is there and we need uh, NATO. But NATO is not uh, a political organization. It is not a, a country or, or a confederacy of, of countries. It's a military yeah. alliance. What we have seen in the Ukraine and in other crises is that the unity, the political unity of the European Union, which is a political organization, is essential. So we, we need both. And um, the European Union is one of the, the countries that uh, are components of the European Union are important allies in, in, in NATO. And what the European Union can do is to ensure that those countries contribute more effectively to NATO, which is contributing also to the European, the European defense. Um, so what is a bit ridiculous is uh, having 27 uh, countries, each with its defense budget, each uh, manufacturing a little here, a little there, uh, with uh, different specifications for the for the weapons, replicating each other's capabilities and replicating each other's limitations and, and absences. Because at the end result, it is not that we are spending 1.5% uh, of GNP on defense, which is ridiculous, seeing what, what is happening around Europe. It is ridiculous. Uh, it is that we are spending it so badly that it is equal to, I don't know, to 0.1% of GNP. I can assure you that, that uh, practically no European country is capable of embarking on 
on a projection of force, on a serious projection of force, including probably uh, yeah, with uh, we have seen the two uh, aircraft carriers in, in Portsmouth, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so we've got to get our act together. The UK is very important in this. It is one of the most powerful armies in the European Union, and we need it. We need to come together, especially if things turn, turn badly in November in the elections in the in the United States. What can we do? Well, the Commission of Defense is very good symbolically because it can bring all the pieces together. We have got the EDF, the European Defense Facility, and that is a way of pulling money. It's a extra communitarian fund. So without getting technical, it is countries putting money into the pot instead of the European, but the European Union budget. But that pot is important because you can use it for common endeavors, such as buying weapons for the Ukraine or buying essential weapons for, for Europe. You have got, we have got another fund now on defense industries and research and development. We have got to do our research and, de research and development together uh, to develop, for example, a new generation of fighter jets. No country can do that. It is too expensive. We've got to do all of us together, coordinate um, weapons research, weapons acquisition and deployment. Many things that we can do, and we have also got to spend more. We have got to go probably over the 2%, but especially we've got to be more clever about the way uh, we spend. And then there is one last question, of course. Uh, if if uh, worse comes to worse, there is the question of uh, the nuclear umbrella over Europe. Uh, for the time being, there are two countries with nuclear capabilities in Europe, the UK and France. Um, in, in the world of nuclear weapons, I don't want to talk too much about this because it is not clear, but uh, deterrence and are more important than, fortunately, more important than use. You have to have a credible deterrence. If your adversary is threatening you with the use of nuclear weapons, which once again, unfortunately, don't put a bad mark on me because you should put it on Putin. <laughs> it is happening. You should have a credible deterrence. Reform of the UN Security Council. Uh, right now, it's a utopia, but I think a utopia we should think about. And EU representation in the European Council in a remodeled European, um, uh, sorry, Security Council would be important too. But the end of the message is, we've got to get our act together. We have had several close calls. We've had Syria with 3 million refugees thrown into, into the, the muddy roads of Europe. It nearly sunk the European Union. It nearly disappeared over the tensions of those 3 million people. We have had the first close call on the Ukraine. We have had Libya. The world is not a safe place. And unfortunately, it is people with authoritarian leaders who don't improve like wine with, 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 with time, who are to a certain extent unpredictable. We have got to act with the prudence of the pater familias. We have been, we should be able to protect ourselves. Next question over here. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for being here. I have two questions. Yeah, uh, who you are, please. Uh, my name is Andres. I'm from Colombia. I am a student uh, at the Master in Science in Local Economic Development. And my first question is about your leadership. So how you can deal when there are conflict interests between uh, UK and Spain, for example, after Brexit, uh, about fees in imports, trade, how you can deal with that when there are conflict interests. And my second question is about the current war. So how much money and how much time Spain and the European Union uh, is willing to, to give money and time for Ukraine for win the war because now there are uh, elections coming up in Russia. Maybe it's possible that increase the expenditure. But in the other hand, we have a conflict interest in US about the the pack, the help pack uh, to help Ukraine, and there are elections in Europe. So what do you, what do you think about the future? In how much time and how much money you can help? Okay. Good, thank you. Good, thank you. 
Well, um, your first question, ambassadors, um, notoriously careless. We are complaining all the time, but we complain in a very diplomatic way. We call the FCDO or whatever minister is in charge of the policy. And we say, I mean, I admire you so much. You are so good and all that, but could you please stop, uh, you know, doing this or doing that? Or, uh, so we are, we are mediators and we try to do things with, uh, with a smile on our faces. Uh, just today to prepare for this lecture, I had a breakfast with David Cameron, with the foreign secretary. True. Get breakfast with him and um it's a strange because i hate waking up early in the morning but i don't know what happened with me i i misread my my watch or whatever and i arrived uh nearly half an hour early to the breakfast the breakfast at the at lancaster house uh, for all eu ambassadors and he arrived early too so we just spent 15 minutes uh, talking before the others arrived and there i tried to sleep everything that concerns us you know reset of the status and negotiations with Gibraltar are going and so on and so forth. So um, you've got to be a nice guy when you are ambassador. When you are director general, then you can afford to, to be more disagreeable. Um, the second question, the Ukraine. We have given 6 billion euros in weapons through the European uh, defense facility. And then individual countries have given a lot more than that. For example, Germany, I think the latest figure is 17.5. Uh, so 17,500 million euros, just Germany. Uh, France, they dispute the figures. They say more, but more or less 4 billion. Uh, Spain, I don't have the figures, but we have made a big contribution, including Leopard tanks, NAMS uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, defense systems, et cetera, et cetera. And not only that, the European Union has done two very important things. One is to finance the Ukraine, and that is something that we do way back, not now, but that now we have accelerated, giving financial support to the Ukraine. And uh, the last European Council approved 50 billion in financing for the, U uh, for the Ukraine, which is going to keep the, that country afloat because it is on a war e economy. And on the other hand, I, I think that Europe has opened its doors to Ukrainian refugees, Europe, including the United Kingdom. In Spain, more than 200,000 Ukrainian refugees. Uh, they, they have been scholarized, they've been helped, they are living there. So that is also important as a sign of solidarity. We've got to do even more, but but I think that we have done uh, quite a bit. Next question. It's over here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Daniel. I study uh, political economy at here at LSE, and I'm from Germany. Um, my question is: uh, You mentioned EU enlargement and mentioned Ukraine, very important. But what is sometimes a bit forgotten is the whole Western Balkan, and your country plays a very critical role uh, by not recognizing Kosovo as a, as a own country. So my question is: When? Will Spain start to recognize Kosovo as a country and play a more constructive role in, in the Balkan integration process? Thank you very much. Where did you say you were from? Germany. Germany. Oh, Germany. But where in Germany? South Germany? West? South Germany. Yeah. South Germany. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, <clears throat> well, the situation in the, the, the Western Balkans are an important part of, uh, of the the complicated equation of, of this year. In demographic and economic terms, not so much. I mean, when you look at uh, Northern Africa, which we completely ignore, like Latin America, when you look at Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, Egypt, the, the, the numbers, uh, the population, the economy, their influence on the southern shores of the Mediterranean, uh, I think that we do spend a lot of time on the Western Balkans. I'm sure I've well spent time, but we should maybe think a bit about those countries uh, too, unless we want to be uh, disagree disagreeably surprised sometime in the future, like we were with the Libya crisis. Um, the Western uh, Balkans have got already uh, membership of the European Union in some cases, in other cases not. Uh, many of the uh, countries in the Western Balkans are candidates to the European Union. The process hasn't been easy. Uh, it's not ours to, to blame, but frankly, the political evolution in some of these countries hasn't been exemplary. 
Uh, the case of Kosovo, uh, Spain now has got uh, informal relations with the Kosovo authorities, and we wish the best to, to Kosovo. Um, but it was a part of a, of a uh, recognized state, a United Nations recognized state. And Spain is very firm that changes in the map and territorial changes have got to be negotiated and have must be subject to a very wide consensus because it is very, very dangerous to start saying, well, in this case, yes, we, we take a, a, a bit of land from this nation and, and we uh, uh, make it independent. No, in that case, no, it is, it is bad. Uh, we think this is a very serious thing to alter the territorial order that, that came out of uh, 1945. So the time of Kosovo will probably come. Um, we look with sympathy at all the region, and we look with a lot of sympathy at, at Kosovo, but for the, for the time being, uh, we don't recognize. Uh, next question. Thank you very much. Over there. Sorry. Hello. First of all, I wanted to thank you for coming, Mr. Marco. It's a pleasure to have you here at the LSE. My name is Jose Pablo Carbonet. I'm from Alicante, and I study PP here at the university. And I wanted to ask you regarding, as you've just mentioned, the North African countries, and relationships of Spain with uh, Frente Polisario, Algeria, and Morocco. Given that Spain has really good relations economic-wise with Algeria as their main uh, energy suppliers for a few years going now, and uh, given that the Frente Polisario leader has been hospitalized in Spain in recent years, why do you think there's been a swift in Spanish mentality towards aligning more with the Moroccan values instead of the Algerian and making Algeria rise the cost of energy significantly in Spain? Why has this shape happened and what's your personal opinion on the future relations of Spain with North African countries? Thank you. Well, I'm very relieved because with your question, I think there are no horrible, complicated subjects left than anybody else can ask. <laughs> we already have met Kosovo, now uh, <laughs> enter Pisario. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so um, without going into the long history of, of this uh, conflict, um, well, first of all, it is really, really almost a tragedy, but it is it's really sad that Algeria and Morocco don't get along with each other. Nothing should have stopped them from getting along with each other. They share a lot of, of, of history. They share the same, same land in Northern Africa. They share regions, uh, language, and, and goals and interests. And uh, this enmity between uh, the political leadership, because I don't think it is between the people of Morocco and Algeria, is very bad for the Maghreb, for the whole region and for the European Union. It has stopped us from, from having more effective policies to, uh, to bring up the, the Maghreb. Um, regional policies, development regional policies, for example, are almost impossible. You cannot build uh, common infrastructures in, in, in countries uh, uh, regard each other as enemies. Spain is a very good friend of Morocco and a very good friend of Algeria. Very traditional, very good friend of both, linked to them by geography and by and by history. Um, but in the in the uh, when we are talking about the conflict in the, the Sahara in Western Sahara, uh, Spain has decided that you have got to go with reality. Um, if you can envision an independent uh, Western Sahara under Polisario leadership, well, I mean, it's always good to have visions, as I said, but it is, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. Sometimes, you know, the train goes off the station, the world moves on, and you've got to go for the solution that causes the less damage or causes the better, uh, uh, the better future for for a region. Uh, it is something that most countries in the in the world have already done. Um, Morocco's behavior, conduct in the Western Sahara, it's not for me to judge Morocco, but but I think that they've done quite a good job there. And they have spent a lot of money there. Uh, the, the Sahara, the Western Sahara, has changed enormously in the last thirteen years. I'm not an expert, but what they tell me is that. The region is, is going well. Uh, of course, the, the Sahrawi population must be taken into account. It must be respected. Their rights must be 
I recognize. Uh, I'm a diplomat, so I, my opinion is that there is always a deal to be made. And a bad deal is much better than a protracted uh, conflict. That is it. Okay, next question. There was one over here. Yes, over there. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Gaspar from Madrid. I study here at the LSE. I wanted to ask you about, uh, you talked about Ukraine being um, let into the European Union. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you think that's a good idea to let a new uh, country that is in, a, in the state of war right now into uh, the European economy, uh, especially considering the very hard complaints that had been going on from agricultural sectors about uh, European Union policy. Um, I am a firm believer myself in the European Union and I share your views, but I've, I feel like maybe this is um, creating more, is, is making the European Union bigger than it should be and not focusing on maybe federalization or pushing uh, to, for a higher power of Belgium. It's giving ideas to the critics of, of the European Union. I would like to know what you think. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspar. Gracias, Gaspar. It's a very good question. And um, I've always been of two minds. And try. And try. Eh? I've always been of, 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 when you say it like that, more or less, I try. And try. I've always been of, of two minds uh, about it, me and many people in the European Union. But once again, the train has left the station. Uh, what could we do? 300,000 casualties in the Ukraine. They are standing up for us. They are dying for us. Make no mistake, Putin is attacking uh, Europe. It's, he's attacking our value. What he really hates is that there should be a prosperous, democratic, free Ukraine, a big country like that next door to him. That's what he hates, like, like all autocrats. That is a threat to, to him. And uh, we cannot uh, make the Ukraine part of NATO, unfortunately, because it is in a state of war. We would be immediately involved in, in the war. But we can uh, make the Ukraine part of ourselves. And that is the way the European Union has always acted. Right. How could we say no to Greece or no to Spain in the, in, in the 80s? How could we say no to Eastern Europe? after the world fell. So you're right. Maybe we have we would have been happier in our cocoon and more united. I don't know whether we would have been more united with the with the French and I'm married to a French woman. <laughs> I don't know whether we would have been more united, but yeah, core values are the motor of Europe, they more cohesive and more inward union, that those are all the arguments and more prosperous too. Uh, if the Ukraine became a member today, Bulgaria, which is the poorest member of the European Union, would have to start to be a net contributor. That is the immense difference in wealth between the Ukraine and Bulgaria, which is receiving billions of euros in, in uh, uh, European policies, would have next day to start contributing, being a net contributor to agricultural policy and to the common policies of the European Union. So this is tough, but what can we do? This is the uh, this is the way the European Union is. We embrace those that look up to our values, that want to live in a space of, uh, of freedom, and um, and it is going to be tough. But we have got to. It's a path we have we have chosen. Um, we have to reform the European Union. We cannot go on with 27 commissioners. We cannot go on with veto power and uh, unanimity vote on all important questions. Not only on the policy, but the fiscal policy, and the defense policy. Um, we have to reinforce the safeguards in the European Union against those that don't share the values of our club, against those that don't respect law and order. The more we are, the more vigilant we have to be. But uh, I think it's the, the way. The way. Thank you, uh, Gaspar. Before I go into the 
your second surname would happen to be uh, Taroncher. No. No. Yeah, what, what are your surnames? Uh, no, then, uh, then it's not. I just uh, confused. More hands. So we have more hands so over here. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Neil. I'm from Mexico, studying a master's in political science. And uh, I just have two quick questions. The first is, um, well, how does the European Union and Spain in particular react to the slow emergence of China as an economic, as a technological power and its influence in other regions of the world? And the second is that in 2018, the Mexican president uh, politely asked Spanish uh, royalty to you know, we'll say sorry for the mistakes of the conquista. So what is the position of the Spanish government, of the Spanish, uh, of Spain, of the Kingdom of Spain in general, uh, in regards to this, and if there is a future prospect of recognizing the rights and wrongs of the conquista? Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I had forgotten about the conquista when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I like moving around. So if you if suddenly I trip on this because I need this came back here, and you have to be careful not to fall. So, and also I want to hear from from the the, the ladies because if yes, not a single. Eh? So the next question we we got later. we have a hand already. So okay. uh, it's the first hand. Okay. I well, the hand is a good start. Then we need the other hand. And anyway, um, the first question was China, China. Yeah. China. I mean, uh, yeah, you cannot ignore China. Um, I mean, you, you, you all know, we are talking here about uh, 1.5 billion people, about uh, probably in, in terms of uh, PP, the first economy in the world, it is there with the United States. And going very fast up the value of the technological scale, as you know, we have tried to stop them a bit by buying the most advanced microchips from China. And they are already establishing independent production lines. Them. Um, we are talking about a very influential actor on the world stage, its road and belt initiative, its trading and aid policies. Um, they are watching very, they are watching us very closely, watching for signs of weakness. They are watching what happens in the Ukraine. That's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we have to win in the Ukraine is China. We've seen that in Siberia, they are already the new petrochemical complexes that Russia cannot build and because of sanctions we are not building. They are building them. The oil and gas that Russia is not selling to, to Europe because of sanctions. <laughs> they are selling it to China. They are, basically they are taking over taking over Siberia. I mean, uh, Big club for, for Putin. This war was for the uh, for the independence of Russia and for the greatness of Russia because thanks to the war, China is basically taking over over Siberia. Uh, anyway, China is also a force for good. China is um, a continent and a people absent from from history for the last hundred years mired in, in horrible civil wars and tragedy invaded downtrodden now we are talking about the conquista let us talk about the opium wars now they come back on the world stage and they're bringing a lot to the table it's wonderful to have china today and they're doing a lot of very good things i've been for example involved in developing cooperation for a very long time now all i read in the newspapers is how awful chinese cooperation policies are how many countries depend on how no, they are doing things in a different way. They are making some mistakes. They are, but they are also avoiding a lot of the mistakes we made with our development policy. And they are good, doing good things in Africa. In and for climate change, for big world management issues such as, for example, climate change, uh, they are essential. And they are doing it. Um, they are going into production of, of uh, renewable machinery, which, you know, China. What we have seen on wind and solar would be impossible in the institution of China. But they are doing with electric cars. It is very important what they do. But um, they are a risk for us and they are a challenge in, in, in many ways. Uh, you have to put on the other side of the balance with goods 
facial recognition, recognition uh, technology, a concept of individual freedom that doesn't correspond to uh, two hours. We have to share the same world. It's becoming a much, much smaller world. So we have to talk. We have to talk a lot and to coordinate, but we have also got to be vigilant. We cannot be complacent. We cannot, that is the concept of strategic autonomy. We cannot rely on the uh, on the goodness of, of, of our partners. Dialogue, but be vigilant. On the conquistas, uh, I think that it was Newton that says the hypothesis non fingo. I don't talk about hypothesis. I would like to say, I don't like to talk about the past. Um, the conquista or the uh, discovery of the Americas, what happened in the 16th century, it changed the world completely. Uh, and the world that we have today is the world created by the, the conquista. There were mistakes, I would say that. There were more than mistakes, there were tragedies, there were catastrophes, of course. Uh, some of them may be inevitable, others completely uh, avoidable. Um, but we cannot go back on the past. We can acknowledge, we can, we should, some people say we shouldn't judge the past by our standards. No, I believe that we should judge the past by our standards because they are past. We should call a massacre a massacre, something inhuman, we should call it inhuman. But at the same time, <laughs> because you can do more than, more than two things at the same time. You know? said that Gerard Ford was incapable of walking and chewing gum at the same time, but you are capable of holding two thoughts in, the, in your head at the same time. Not contradictory thoughts, but different thoughts. Uh, at the same time that you we judge the past by our standards, we should understand it in its context by its standards, by what was happening then on, uh, on, on, on in the end. Uh, it's, um, without avoiding the question, for me, it is funny to think that maybe in some sense, I mean, an analogies are wonderful. What is happening in 2024 is a bit of the, the other side of the mirror to what happened in 1492, 1825, et cetera, et cetera. Then we brought horrible pandemics to the rest of the world, and in this case, in, in Latin America. Now, because of this interconnected world from the deep forest of Cameroon or the marketplaces of Wuhan, we are getting um, a ration of, of strange uh, illnesses. Uh, then we started the period of Europe growing demographically, economically, taking over the world. Now we are on the cusp of the rest of the world regaining its rightful place. And Europe and the West being diminished economically and demographically. And then the world was becoming larger. The new uh, Terra Nullius, what we call Terra Nullius, new spaces were open to the world. Now the world is becoming smaller thanks to uh, the means of communication, the roads, the fence. I'm great for analogies, also analogies. Of course. In any case, to end the question, I think that, that Spain, everyone in Spain, our historians, our public opinion, our newspapers, they all recognize the tragedies and humanities and catastrophes that for the Aboriginal people of the Americas were to conquista. But we are, to tell you this, you see, we are also very proud that together with, with those people who survived, they didn't survive in the United States, but they did survive in Latin America and the Together with them, we created the new world and the music, the literature, the way of thinking of that continent is unique. We created a new world that we should we should cherish and value and interact with it, with this world today in 2020. Thank you very much. There were quite a lot of uh you use actually quite a lot of hands. Really, but, really. No, but it's uh, right at the back over there first. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'm Gabriela, I'm from Madrid. I'm a social policy and politics student here. And I wanted to ask you regarding Latin America relations with Spain and the European Union and how recent elections in Argentina, as well as uh, upcoming elections in El Salvador, uh, Dominican Republic and other Latin American countries, how do you think uh, results could change relationships with Spain 
and on the European U Union and how have uh, they changed with Spanish governments? Because uh, you've been a diplomat. Well, Aznar was here, for example, uh, president of Spain and now Pedro Sanchez. Have you seen any changes regarding elections? Thank you very much. So um, if changes have, like, if relationships have changed um, regarding elections, both in South America and Spain. So if Spanish government um, and who was president made an impact between the relationships between the countries. Well, thank you. Th first of all, thank you very much for opening the fire, with your agenda. I've got two more women and I, I'll take their questions. I'm just going to say <laughs> that around in around five, six minutes, we will start wrapping up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is, but I think that that is more than certain uh, our time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, Latin America is moving. I, I don't know that well the continent, although I served for two years in Nicaragua during the Sandinista Revolution. And by the way, Ortega is still there, I mean, amazing. Um, so Latin America, uh, once again, as I said, it's a new world. It's a world, for me, it is firmly in the, in the, in the West, in, in our tradition. It believes in freedom, believes in social justice. Uh, people there are not afraid to speak their minds and to step up uh, to the plate. And there are many injustices there, in many economic injustices, many social injustices, a lot of inequality. Uh, there are also um, racial tensions. There is an Indian population, if you want to define it in linguistic terms, but you know, there is a spectrum between whiteness and uh, Indianness, which I say with the majority of the population in the middle, but in some countries it is more marked than in others, for example in Bolivia. So each country has its own its own uh, challenges. Uh, Argentina, which is a very white country, has had governance problems for a very long time, but at the same time Argentina has been having a good time for a very long time and contributing a lot to the, to the world, its writers, Thinkers, it's, it's artists. Uh, now it's going through dire economic straits. We've got Mille uh, at the helm. Uh, frankly, I cannot brief him. Um, you make up your own minds about him. Um, it's, it's going to be it's going to be interesting what is going to happen there in the next few months. But we don't have any special problem with Mille, nor we nor do we have a problem with with Bukale. I mean, we have a problem with anybody who tramples uh, freedom and human rights. But Bukale per se, I mean, there is a big problem of violence in, in Central America, as you know. And if you are a poor person living in El Salvador, and I'm told, I lived for two years in Nicaragua, then if your life is uh, threatened all the time by the guards, if you cannot go out of your house, if you are afraid of your your daughter is going to be raped, or your son is going to be inducted or killed, or whatever. And you don't care about what somebody does as long as you see uh, the problem go down. And that, of course, is, is fertile grounds for, for, for politics. Uh, once again, we've got to, to support policies in Latin America that combat the, the violence, which in part is, is um, linked to drugs and weapons. So I'm not going to get into it, but we don't have a special problems. Frankly, Spain doesn't have any special problems in, in, in Latin America. Um, I think that you wanted to ask a question. Maybe. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Professor Andres. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned... Sorry, can you say your name and uh, where you're from? Yeah, my name is Maria, and I'm from Spain as well. I'm from Madrid, and I'm currently studying PPE here at the LSE. Um, Ambassador, I was wondering, you mentioned repeatedly throughout the lecture today on the importance of coming together in Europe, uh, given the current context of geopolitical uncertainty and um, nuclear threats ahead, right? I was wondering... To what extent uh, will Brexit have a negative effect, if any, in the UK's and EU's capacity to come together um, against these future geopolitical risks? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, 
Well, um, Brexit, of course, was felt uh, deeply in the European Union. I know I had two, two um, a son and a daughter studying here in the, in the UK. Uh, my daughter, for example, was part of the Remain campaign. They, they were both very bitter after the, the election and the, in fact, they left the, the UK. My, my son was offered a, a doctorate at Cambridge and he, he felt so bad that he preferred to accept another one at Zurich and left my daughter also. So a lot of people were very disappointed um, by the vote, but it is what it is. Uh, it was David Cameron that called for this vote. The last 10 referendums on Europe have all had a, a, a no to Europe vote. He, he knew what was coming, I mean, in Poland, in France, in Italy, in the Netherlands, in Denmark. Every, every time you put a question on Europe, the citizens think it is, it is gratis, a protest free vote, and they vote no. You, golden rule, don't call referendums on Europe. Indeed, now the UK is out of Europe, we feel it deeply. Defects are being felt today, 60% less students in, in UK universities. So felt at the human level, a lot more difficulties for young people to come here to work, then with the English, contribute to this economy, and then go back to their countries. Uh, something that is positive for the UK, positive for us. Mobility, youth mobility. We are working on it as an ambassador and as part of the group of EU ambassadors, but also as ambassador to Spain, for us it is a priority to sign an ambitious new mobility agreement with the UK so that at least young people can move freely. Uh, and to, if possible, to have the UK uh, rejoin Erasmus and things make things uh, easier. Horizon, joining Horizon was already a success and uh, rejoiced us. Um, UK, Brexit, um, the constraints, the fiscal constraints that the UK has have today in part are because of Brexit, because of course, when, when you've got the Germany behind you and the Euro behind you, it is easier to borrow. You don't have the limitations that Liz Truss experimented when she tried to have an expansive budget. Then the huge next generation funds to facilitate the transition to uh, a sustainable economy, fight against climate change and digital economy. The UK doesn't have access to them. And now here, Starmer has renounced to its 28 billion Euro or pound pledge to fight against climate change. In the UK, where in Europe, we have access to those funds. Um, our hope is that, I mean, the, the UK is, is here, it's part of our history. It is part of our society. We've got 400,000 British residents in, the, in, in Spain and 400,000 Spaniards living in the UK, 5 million European Union citizens live in this country. We don't want to lose that. We believe in the same things. We have had a, a very similar history. Um, we probably should forget a bit about Brexit because it, what is done is done. And I don't think that that has a, a, a quick solution. It does not pull ourselves. But we can work within the situation that Brexit, Brexit created to to establish the, the deepest possible links between the UK, the, starting with mobility and following up with the pact on defense and foreign affairs and, you know, and keeping investment and trade rolling, that's all, working together on world, uh, on the world regulation uh, challenges that we have on the fight against climate change, where the UK has always been a front runner in the fight against the pandemics and the regulation of artificial intelligence, on, on the fight against defects in manipulation of election. We haven't talked about that. But we expect big surprises this year. I had lunch with the CEO of Microsoft for Europe, and she said, we now have the capabilities to steal an election in the last 24 hours. CEO says that, it's something to remember about. <laughs> anyway, we have got to work together. We, we are going to get closer, I hope, in, in the future. So we, we are going to, there are going to be elections here. And after the elections, we, we renew our push for closer links. There was another woman who wanted to All right, to so question. last question, then coming. 
and uh, okay, so you can <laughs> shout. The shout. microphone will arrive. Shout it from the rooftops. Hi, um, I'm from the FCDO. Actually, <laughs> from the FCDO. Um, uh, my name is Isla. Um, yeah, but my question was about um, Spain's effectiveness lobbying within the EU. Um, so before um, Spain took the presidency of the EU Council last year, Sanchez said something like, you know, Spain has consistently punched below its weight. Um, so I wanted to ask if you think that the presidency of the EU Council has changed that at all. Um, and also you see something quite interesting, I think, in the EU at the moment with Spain taking quite a different approach to the situation in Gaza to the rest of the EU member states. Um, Spain, along with maybe only Ireland, um, you know, has been a lot more vocal about calling for a ceasefire. Um, so given that its position is so different, but that it hasn't really been able to like change the position of the EU, how does Spain convert itself into the kind of member state that Germany or France is and, and really land those arguments for foreign policy? Thank you. That is a very good question to went up the round. I remember you that your young men shall see visions. I want you to see visions, to, but to see visions, you've got to understand the, the world, to think about the world, not to judge the world, to think about the world, to see the system yeah? before we depart. And before I answer this last question, I want to know how many negative uh, expressions have I used, Eduardo? Not many. Okay. Nine. 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 <laughs> Okay. Good. So um, I've had a, a, a very varied career in the, the diplomat. <laughs> and that has been the fun of it, that I've done many things. I've been a grand ambassador. I, I've been in charge of NGO cooperation for three whole years. I've been in charge of cultural policy in Spain. You know, I've been a bit of a jack of all trades, and, and that is my car. I've enjoyed it. Some other people concentrate on one thing and become great. I've been mediocre a lot. And one of the things I've been mediocre at is the European Union. I've a big part of my career there. I was ambassador for five years there in Corriper One, uh, which the economist has called the most secretive conflict in, in Europe. That is where we make most of the legislation. And I think I know, uh, as well as anybody, how the European Union works. That is, I know it badly because nobody knows how the European Union works. But uh, I don't think that Pedro Sanchez punches under his weight. I think, frankly, I think that, honestly, he punches over his weight. And he will never punch at the level of France and Germany, because that is impossible. That those are the two, by far, the two biggest economies of the European Union, uh, the two biggest uh, armies, the two biggest uh, technological capabilities. We are not going to punch at the level of France and Germany. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, in the dynamics of the European Union, the ruling party is very important. The ruling party at the parliament level. And as you know, the PPE, the, the center right, uh, has had the upper hand for the last 20 years. So a country with a, a center left, a socialist uh, government, is not going to be able to have the same impact as, as a country when the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is from the, from the center right in, in parliament, uh, the majority is from the center right. But within those provisos, uh, Spain is a big country, it's an important country, and Pedro Sanchez, in my opinion, is undoubtedly the leader of the center left in Europe, the leader of the socialists, uh, and he's not shy of using that, that power, the power as uh, head of government of Spain and an official leader uh, with Costa now alone of the socialists in Europe. Like he did, for example, in the European Council where he held the European Council up until four o'clock in the morning until at least they agreed to write humanitarian laws at the end of the council, called for a humanitarian laws. Or when Spain, and then I was working in Spain, when Spain planted firmly its foot on the ground and said, we need a huge amount of funds 
to face the aftermath, economic aftermath of the pandemic, and they must be common European funds. We were instrumental in, in uh, the shape and the size of the next generation funds. And we are also front runners in so many issues, like, for example, um, development cooperation and protection of the rights of uh, women, or the fight against climate change. The new, we pushed the European Union into accepting the Iberian exception and not tying the price of gas to the price of other energies. And now under our presidency, a new model for electricity and energy markets has been approved. So I do think he punches at his weight, but it's not the way. German price. You have been a wonderful audience. Never fielded so many and so many difficult questions in my life. I will be back. I will be back. Thank you okay. No, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, you all for coming. Uh, we had a short uh, presentation and I had a lot of questions prepared just in case there were no questions. There were a lot of questions. I apologize to people at the back that wanted to ask questions. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to do it, but we have had almost an hour of direct responses by Ambassador Marco to all of you. And I'm very grateful for you to you for coming here, taking questions without any filter, and not just taking any questions, but probably you said you could, they covered all the difficult issues that you could deal with and you deal with them very, very well. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. It's a pleasure thank to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, all of you, we have another event coming from the Cañada Plan Center that will take place on the 25th of uh, March. It would be in the Hong Kong Theater, and we'll have Salvador Illa, who is the former Minister of uh, Health during the pandemic, and now the leader of the Catalan Socialists, coming to give a talk, and the format would be exactly the same, so we expect many of you to come back here and to actually ask the difficult questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.